In 2001, JSA Joint Security Era ushered in a new age of Korean cinema. It was one of the first films released after the fall of a military dictatorship and relaxed censorship laws. It was also one of the first South Korean films to find international success, releasing in theaters in Europe and North America, and winning awards at the Seattle and Berlin International Film Festivals and the Deville Asian Film Festival in France. Shoulda looked up how to pronounce that city's name. A couple of years earlier, H.O.T. or HOT were performing alongside Michael Jackson and Soul, playing their international hit, Candy. The five-member group were arguably the first successful version of the modern K-pop band, touring the world and releasing hit single after hit single. Now, 20 years later, Squid Game is the number one show on Netflix, BTS is dominating the charts, Korean tech firms like Samsung and Kia are major institutions, and even Korean baseball was dominating ESPN at 5 o'clock in the morning during the pandemic in 2020. It seems like everywhere you look, Korea is at the forefront of our culture. It's stunning, considering not only South Korea's small size, or the fact that Korea is split in half, but also the fact that until just 30 years ago, the country was in a constant state of turmoil. The recent meteoric rise of Korean culture didn't happen by accident. It's a direct result of a nearly three-decade-long experiment by the Korean government called Hallyu, or the Korean Wave, an extensive and ambitious plan that saved Korea from disaster. In 1910, Korea formally became a colony of Japan, technically. Japanese control of Korea goes as far back as the 1880s, but that's a story for another day. Japan's treatment of Koreans was abysmal. They banned the Korean language, Koreans had to adopt Japanese names and work exclusively for Japanese companies, and when Japan started losing battles in World War II, they conscripted Korean men into the army and navy, while women were made comfort women which is to say they were forced into prostitution for the sake of Japanese soldiers. To this day, there is still heavy resentment between the two countries. After World War II, control over Korea simply moved from Japan to the United States and the Soviet Union. The Soviets invaded China and Korea in the final days of the war. That left North Korea to the Soviets and South Korea to America. After over 35 years of brutal Japanese rule, Korea was now under the divided, brutal rule of two puppet dictators, Kim Il-sung in the north and Syngman Rhee in the south. These dudes were two sides of the same Samsung Galaxy Z Flip 3. They both ruled with an iron fist, and anyone who disagreed with them weren't even accidented. They were just straight up killed in the streets or dragged to labor camps. After a three-year war between the North and South that brought in the US, the UN, China, and the Soviet Union, the two countries followed radically different tracks. Not much has changed in North Korea since the end of the war. You've probably heard all about the re-education camps, extreme poverty, nuclear weapons, isolationism, etc. As for South Korea, the following four decades were turbulent, with countless coups, regime changes, political protests, mass killings. It was a pretty terrible time for a country that had grown used to terrible times. Everything came to a head in 1980 with the Gwangju Uprising and Massacre, sparked by the assassination of the dictator Park Chung-hee the previous year. Students in the city of Gwangji began protesting the new regime en masse, which led to much of the population taking up arms against the government, who sent in the military, resulting in the deaths of at least 160 citizens and the arrest of thousands more. This led to more protests and uprisings across the whole country. It wasn't until the June struggle in 1987 that the doors were blown off, with protests lasting for weeks until the new government allowed open, democratic elections for the first time in South Korean history, and the Sixth Republic was formed under President Ro Tae-woo. That was a rushed version of events to say the least, but it's a basic timeline that should hopefully explain the position Korea was in come the turn of the millennia. Korea's misfortunes in the 1900s have had a profound effect on its people. Korean-American writer Yuni Hong in her book The Birth of Korean Cool says there's even a turn for this, Han. By definition, she writes, only Koreans have Han, which arises from the fact that the universe can never pay off this debt to Koreans, not ever. Her mother has a good definition of it too. When sad things happen, not by your own design, but by fate, over a long period of time. 
There's a debate today about Han, sometimes referred to as the beauty of sorrow, a term by Japanese poet Yang Ai Suetsu, and how accurate it is and how much of a stereotype it is, but regardless, Korea's modern art is inseparable from its history. We're talking about a century of censorship and brutality finally being eradicated, and all that anger, sorrow, and resentment of those times are being expressed now. But there is one final piece to this puzzle, besides history and new laws, and that would be what we in the refest... fest? We in the West, I'm not redoing this take, refer to as the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Thanks in part to some shenanigans in Thailand, Korean businesses began failing as international creditors lowered the country's credit rating. Again, that's super oversimplification, but you get the gist. Later that year, the International Monetary Fund gave South Korea a $58.4 billion relief package on the condition that the government open more Korean businesses to outside investment. The IMF is a global organization made up of 190 countries that sort of acts like a world bank. South Korea, being a member of the IMF, were eligible for a relief package, but had to meet the conditions to receive the funds and also pay it off with interest at some point in the future. Two of the conditions for the loan, including shutting down failing banks rather than trying to bail them out, and regulating big business, called shables in South Korea. So by 2003, over 700 companies were shut down or merged by the government, and they curbed the shables' ability to expand and collect more federal aid. Then President Kim Young Sam was widely blamed for the economic failures and mass corruption, and was booted from office in favor of Kim Dae Jung in 1998. Dae Jung took the groundwork laid by his predecessor and ran with it, devising the plan that we now know as Hallyu. Dae Jung and the Korean head of global PR agency Edelman co-authored the book Korea On Course and Open for Business, aimed at global investors. A real thrilling read, let me tell you. It's full of the usual stuff, stories about Koreans pulling themselves up by the bootstraps and working hard during hard times. But it also stressed that the country would open to the outside world, not only bringing in investors, but outputting culture. It talked about easy access to the internet, and how the country was easing restrictions on cinema, music, and the written word in an effort to help pay off their debts. In essence, the government would start exporting its culture to the outside world as a means of making money. Ironically, it was President Young Sam that initially started what would become Hallyu. In 1992, a South Korean diplomat named Chung In Jun, the head of the Korean Culture and Tourism Institute at the time, smuggled a Betamax tape of the K-drama What is Love into the Korean consulate in Hong Kong. Back then, there were strict laws about shipping broadcast quality videos between borders, blah blah blah. He then got the show broadcast on a local TV station there, backed by the Korean government who paid for a Cantonese translation of the episode, and and bought up ad time during the show so that it would air. It was the first government-backed initiative to spread K-culture outside the Korean borders, and it was a huge success. The show became a colossal hit, airing twice a week in Hong Kong. Soon the show was picked up in mainland China, which helped it spread further into Asia and driving the desire for more K-dramas. And from there, things snowballed. The success of that show helped spark a new wave of thinking from the government. According to Ted O'Callaghan, writing for Yale Insights, the government commissioned a study from the Presidential Advisory Board on Science and Technology in 1994, which found that Jurassic Park, released that year in Korea, earned as much money as the sale of 1.5 million Hyundai cars, which was twice what they normally sold annually. So when Daejeon came into office, he knew exactly what to do. So there it is. Hallyu, the Korean way began as an effort by President Kim Dae-jung to save the Korean economy and pay off their massive debts. All these Korean movies, TV shows, and K-pop bands you're familiar with are a direct result of Dae-jung's plan. The Korean government took a large chunk of money they got from the IMF and directly pumped it into pop culture, creating grants, new schools, new businesses designed around creating films, TV shows, bands, food industries, and technology. Not only was the goal to make enough money in the short term to pay off those debts, but they also had the more ambitious plan to influence culture around the world. 
As noted in a foreign policy article from 2012, Korean culture has been a prominent mainstay in youth culture in Latin America, the Middle East, and North Africa for decades now. The Korean government has made it a point to target developing nations, particularly in those regions I just mentioned, to sort of infiltrate with K-culture, providing internet services and technology, and then using that infrastructure to send them K-dramas, K-movies, and K-pop. According to the Korean Times, in 2007, the city of Tehran was so enraptured by Jewel in the Crown that the show drew a whopping 90% TV rating. They perhaps slightly over-exaggeratingly say that the entire city went quiet whenever the show came on air. On Spotify, Indonesia is second only to the United States in terms of the number of K-pop streams. In Wee Tak Wan's book Hallyu from K-pop to K-culture, he talks about how in Argentina, a Korean fruity ice cream pop called Maloney is one of the most popular treats there. And Russia imports huge quantities of kimchi ramen from Korea. There's also an example from Thailand where an ad for Lipton tea featured like a loser trying and failing to impress some girl only to drink the Lipton iced tea, which transforms him into some Korean-speaking playboy. It almost sounds cynical when you say that culture and art is being used to save the economy, and maybe it is. Mass-produced culture exported the world over to rebuild an economy today and control it tomorrow. The idea of selling your culture to influence citizens the world over may sound like a revolutionary idea, but it's actually been around for decades. Former chair of the American National Intelligence Council, Joseph Nye, first coined the phrase soft power in 1990. It's basically the use of non-military means to project a nation's power globally with the goal of influencing other nations. Primarily, that's through culture and technology. Sound familiar? None of that is to say the artists themselves only care about money or the political influence of Korea on a global scale or anything like that. Parasite and Snowpiercer director Bong Joon-ho and the singer Psy of Gangnam Style fame consistently criticize and examine Korean society and politics in their work. Squid Game is all about the failures of capitalism and the crippling housing crisis going on in Korea right now. And when the Korean government funds films with an explicit agenda, there is backlash. A 2018 film called Unfinished tells the true story of a South Korean economist defecting to North Korea, only to re-defect? Undefect? What's the terminology there? A few years later. A report from Kim Eun-joon's newsroom found that 4.3 billion won of the film's 4.5 billion won budget was directly funded by then-President Park Gwen hees government for the purpose of promoting patriotism, nationalism, and induced public support for the government. In 2016, the year the film went into production, Park faced a massive political scandal over some really crazy stuff involving a cult and a sunken ferry and was later impeached. I don't want to give the impression that all K-culture is blatant propaganda or made purely for the sake of turning a profit. The artists involved, for the most part, truly want to make art, and the most successful Korean TV shows and movies at least prove that. JSA was the second major international Korean film hit after Shiri a year earlier, but it was JSA that showed what Korean cinema could truly be with the right support. It's the rare example of a piece of art and a commercial product having equal footing with each other. And again, it worked. According to Oxford Economics, in 2018, Korea's movie and TV industry brought in 21.8 trillion Korean won, or about 18.45 billion US dollars. The same can be said for every other aspect of K-culture. According to Stastasia, the Korean music industry in 2021 is worth 6.1 trillion won, with an export value of about 562 million US dollars. It's hard to say how much money the Korean tech industry has brought in, but Samsung, which represents 17% of Korea's GDP, reported a revenue of 237 trillion won in 2020, or about 200 billion US dollars. I can keep spitting numbers at you, literally, apparently, but that'd be boring and I think you get the idea. Using culture to bolster the economy worked and continues to work. So to me, the question isn't how does Hallyu work or why is it so popular? For that, you just need to look at Korea's history. Instead, it's how much more popular can K-culture get? How much further can it spread? How long will it last as the world's most popular form of culture? 
The United States and Japan once held that throne, and all empires fall eventually. Is the concept of Han and the need for K-culture to fuel Korean economy enough to make it last in the long term, or is this whole concept just a flash in the pan? Korea has strategically targeted developing nations before spreading K-culture to already developed places like the United States. That's exactly the strategy the US used after World War II, using her influence as a newly established superpower with the Marshall Plan to reshape Europe and Asia in her image. With Korea needing Hallyu to keep growing for the sake of her economy, I think it's a safe bet to say that BTS is here to stay for a good long while.